Welcome, welcome everyone. I see that uh, people are slowly joining us. Let's just wait for everyone to uh, be in the digital room. Uh, you have joined the Repair and Copyright webinar organized by the Right to Repair campaign, overcoming the invisible barriers to repair. We're just gonna wait for a few more minutes to make sure that everyone has the time to join and then we will start. I'm gonna uh, start by letting the participants know about a few housekeeping rules. Um, you probably are very familiar with Zoom. Um, so you know that in the bottom bar, you can see several um, functionalities. Uh, there is a chat function where uh, we warmly invite you, encourage you to interact with each other. And there is a Q&A question where we encourage you to write questions for our panelists and also just food for thoughts, uh, food for debate. So let me repeat that. In the chat, we absolutely invite you to interact with each other, share your thoughts. In the Q&A, we invite you to post questions that we will go back to. And we have a um, team of colleagues that will go through them and help me as a moderator um, read them out loud for uh, the panelists in order for them to uh, answer to you. All right, I see that a solid number of people has joined, so I, I am going to start. Uh, welcome everyone to this uh, Repair and Copyright Overcoming the Invisible Barriers to Repair webinar. Uh, let me start by saying that this webinar is organized by Right to Repair Europe or the Right to Repair European Coalition. Uh, I just wanted to let everyone know a little bit about the campaign so that this can um, set the scene a little bit and give you some context. The campaign was launched during FixFest in Berlin in October 2019. So we're a fairly young campaign. We are a coalition of organizations um, pushing for system change around repair. And Today, the campaign has more than 100 members, 100 different organizations from 21 different countries. And we have a very diverse range of members from community repair groups, such as repair cafes, for instance, to environmental organizations, activists, social economy actors, but also self-repair advocates. So the um, issue here is tackled from an environmental uh, perspective, from a consumer rights perspective, um, and the, the range of members is quite diverse. What we believe is it, what we believe in is that the takeoff of a truly integrated EU market for secondhand and repaired products relies upon the development of a coherent EU legislation. So what we're asking for uh, is basically three things. We have three pillars. Uh, one concerns design. So we believe that there should be design requirements for products enabling quick and easy repair solutions. We also ask for fair and affordable access to repair. This means fair and affordable access to repair, but also spare parts to make repairers independent from manufacturers and to make repair mainstream available everywhere. We also believe that we need information for consumers. Um, empowering the consumers to choose um, more durable, more repairable items and devices is at the base of developing this uh, business model, this solution, and ultimately ending uh, planned obsolescence and keeping our products longer. Um, one um, way of informing the consumers is our, for instance, uh, repairability scores or repairability indexes, something that we're, we're talking quite a lot about um, in the campaign. Um, now, uh, with regards to today's uh, webinar, you have probably seen the blog post, you have probably seen the intro, so you already have a little idea of what, what this is about. Um, as you probably know, much work around the right to repair has been focused on um, 
the physical dimension of uh, how products are put together, for instance, with eco design, the availability of spare parts, access to the tools. Um, when it comes to EU legislation, we uh, go about it product category by product category in some, in some cases. But something that we haven't focused on so much is um, the more intangible dimension, um, which also uh, influences repair, which is copyright and, and software. Um, as you know, these two dimensions are more and more present. And um, whereas they are a very present problem for people trying to repair items and devices, they are not really tackled at EU level or in legislation in general. Uh, so there is a discrepancy there. And this will be the topic today. We have great experts from a legal perspective, but also from a very hands-on perspective. So once more, we welcome everyone to interact in the chat and especially to ask questions in the Q&A. First, we will hear from the panelists. And then we will um, open up the virtual Q&A floor for uh, interactive uh, debate. Um, our first speaker is Steffen Vangero, uh, who is a trained technical craftsman who has spent several years repairing in the workshop and also on site with customers. He's uh, currently running Vangero GmbH in Germany and um, he will be able to present the problem in practice. How does copyright and software limitations, how do they affect your work and your ability to repair, Steffi? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh... Hello, my name is Steffen. I'm from uh, Germany and I'm a uh, professional German handcraft for repairing electronics. Um, I have the honor to talk uh, about the practical problems we have in our workshops all over Germany. So this is our workshop or our uh, office in Reutlingen, which is close to Stuttgart. And um, we have a network of around 1000 workshops all over Germany. So we are dealing every day with the repair of electrical and electronic equipment. So um, we have already have the, the software and the um, copyright issues. Um, I don't want to talk about the smartphone thing um, because my, my uh, colleagues later or my, uh, yeah, after me coming uh, speaker uh, will have the topic smartphone, but I have uh, one uh, interesting number, which is um, uh, uh, we did uh, ask about uh, 800 workshops for repairing smartphones in Germany. And um, we asked them how, um, how happy or how satisfied they are with the business situation. And only 23% of the smartphone repair shops are satisfied with the business situation. And why is that? Um, it's, it's in German, but I can translate. Uh, it's the second, the yellow bar, um, which says software blockades um, the repair or makes the repair more difficult. It's the 87.69% um, that see this as a great or major risk for their future. So um, the software is already the second biggest problem for the workshops in the smartphone area. But it's not only in the smartphone. It's also in every other electronic goods um, happening already. Um, how does software block repairing in practice? Um, first of all, it's the, I think the most famous uh, thing is uh, it makes changing some parts impossible. For example, if you want to repair a, a Thermomix, uh, I think in, in Italy it's called um, Bimbi. Uh, it's a, a, a kitchen machine from uh, Vorwerk or by Vorwerk. And you can't change, for example, the, um, the power or the... the, uh, the electronics, for example, or the or some other parts without getting problems with the electronics. So uh, with the software, you can't change these parts if you're not Vorwerk, uh, the, the manufacturer. 
We have the same problem with smartphones. We have the same problem with uh, some other uh, kind of electronics. For example, um, uh, washing machines, you can't change the electronic uh, without the software because uh, the electronic is not already filled with the software. So uh, we can't repair some washing machines already, some uh, uh, vacuum cleaner, robot uh, uh, things, some um, uh, robo mose, for example. Um, it's in the moment, it's uh, a little problem because the most uh, electronic goods are still uh, possible to repair, or just that we have don't have a software block. Um, but it's getting more and more and um, yeah, it's getting a bigger and bigger problem. So a second uh, possible problem is that we can't delete an error message. So if you have a washing machine, which is pretty typical and you have the, the, the error message C32 or something else, we can repair the problem. We can change the, the pump or we can uh, uh, fix the motor but we can't delete the message. So the machine is still not running, um, which is another big problem with the software because if the manufacturer uh, doesn't give us uh, access to the software, we cannot repair them without changing the electronic too, uh, which is not broken, it's only the software. So we had in the past, for example, which is uh, I think pretty annoying, if you want to change the codes of a, of a washing machine motor, uh, which is a normal part to change. It's not a big problem. It doesn't take uh, a lot of time. Um, but if already there is a, as a message, uh, a message on the on the screen, um, we can't uh, delete this. And so we have we changed the uh, the code for let's say seventy nine or eighty nine euro uh, all all over all with all the work and driving and and so on. And then we have to change the electronic for only 150 euro, only the, the spare part. Um, this makes uh, repairing uh, unattractive. It's more expensive, it takes more time. And uh, we, as a professional workshop, uh, we can get less money because um, the spare parts are getting more expensive. Um, there's also another problem. If you don't have the, um, the software, it could be possible you have to pay more for the electronics. Um, for example, with some um, uh, white good uh, machines from a German brand, um, we had this problem. If we change, we, we've been their, their, their partner. And so we could uh, change the electronic unprogrammed so we had to uh, plug in the electronic on our uh, service device and we could program it and so we paid half um, then you have to pay if you uh, get the full programmed electronics so this is another problem with the with the electronics and another software problem with uh, repairing which stops repairing is if uh, electronic good uh, especially IT and, 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 te and uh, telephones, um, you, if you don't have updates anymore, no one will repair uh, uh, electronic goods with, uh, good with, which has no updates. So why don't we get authorized? So why don't we get uh, the electronics? And there's, there's um, yeah, more than one reason for this. It's not only... Um, that we don't uh, want this or we are not qualified, which is uh, uh, not a big problem. Um, it's, yeah, it's connected to a lot of things we have to do for the manufacturer. For example, the trade turnover. If I want to get a, 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 the, a, the, the authorization by, by some uh, manufacturers, I have to have, for example, one or 200,000 euros of uh, turnover every year and um, which is a little conflict because I want to repair. I don't want to sell new uh, machines. So we are sometimes in the, in the, in the conflict of the trade turnover. And uh, yeah, if you, uh, if you hear the number 100,000 euro or 200,000 or even more, um, you, you can see it's not possible to get this by every manufacturer. Uh, another big problem for us it's, uh, is that it's not transparent. We, we can uh, ask for getting authorized, um, but uh, the manufacturer doesn't need to answer to us. They can just say no, or they 
can just say nothing or they can say anything they want and we have no right or no no law that uh, makes it possible for us to 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 really ask for the the software and another problem is even if a, a manufacturer is interested in, in 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 authorizing us or saying he's interested it's it could be very complicated for a big american smartphone producer we have this problem it's i think it's uh, it's a little bit uh, known because it's been in the press everywhere and uh, there are program for the so called independent repairers um it's very complicated it's very very complicated you have to to uh, sign an, a contract in with international law with a with a um, yeah the 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 this, uh, the the law the case will be discussed in first in i think in ireland and if not uh, then there will be a, a judge in 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 california and it's for me as a german swabian handworker it's unbelievable i don't even have an, a lawyer who could uh, ask uh, who could help me with this contract um never, we don't need to talk about the uh, possible uh, discussion with the with the manufacturer yeah another point why um, some workshops don't want to get authorized is we have to go to the to the um to the to the uh, lessons or to the uh, yeah, i forgot the word so um we have to go to the manufacturer to learn how to repair or to uh, what is special about their machines and um, that's a good situation for them and they really do this it's unbelievable but they do they're poaching our service employees so i sent my my employee to to a manufacturer uh, that he learns how to repair how to fix a, a device of him and it could be uh, that he's not coming back to me so um yeah it's not it's not working on on the same level um we are uh, not uh, treated fair by them so we are maybe some um yeah we we are afraid of 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 the manufacturer because we have a lot of yeah of bad um situation in, in the past uh, together because they just let you fall so we fear the dependency so we fear to be um yeah to to have to ask them for things we fear of uh, making too too much turnover with one big manufacturer because we're getting dependent and it's very bad for us because in the past there have been a lot of uh, workshops that yeah went out of business business because of the uh, big uh, dependent uh, dependency yeah another point is it's complicated with the billing we have to to um fulfill um yeah things we don't understand we don't know why we have to do them we just have to do them because somebody in korea or in america or in somewhere else on the pl uh, planet uh, he wants to have it like this and we have to do it like this uh, we have to use their software and this is very complicated and um, another big problem is the the flat rates we have with them they are very low and it's um yeah this is why it's not attractive to work with a um with a manufacturer if uh, they can can make the rules of working together by their own and they can so uh, working with them together is not not attractive yeah um software prevents a free repair market and we need a free repair market um to make the customers independent from the manufacturers because i don't really think that the manufacturers uh, wants to fix the the devices but also wants to fix the market and the 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 way we um yeah we consume the uh, electronic goods so they don't want long uh, lifetimes of their products not every manufacturer of course but in general i think we can say this they want to sell new devices and um long life uh, electronic goods um they're losing um parts of the market and the the, the really fast running electronic devices um, become more and more uh, important and this is a big problem for us thank you very much for your attention um we do some research in the in the um repairs market in germany of course because we only work in germany so if you're interested in in some uh, numbers out of the professional handcrafters area 
uh, please feel free to contact me and uh, yeah thank you very much thank you very much Stefan for this uh, very concrete presentation on about how this is a problem every day I would say it's uh, it's something that affects your 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 daily life your day, daily workflow whether it is about changing parts or not being able to actually uh, delete the error message um, making it more expensive or just having to think about all of these complicated complications complicated questions about how how to solve this and thank you also for making it clear why it is not a solution for everyone, for every repair business to just get authorized and what the downsides of, of, of that possibility also are. Um, so let's now uh, hear from Anthony Rosborough, who is a PhD researcher at the European University Institute, and he can tell us more about technological protection measures or TPMs and why they are a source of restriction under copyright law and what possible solutions can be. So we have seen the hands-on problem. Let's now hear from a legal expert. So where is the problem in the legislation? How could we fix it? Thank you very much, Christina. Um, yeah, so I think um, Stefan did a fantastic job um, explaining, you know, on the technical level, uh, where uh, where the problem lies, and I, I'm hoping now that I can I can shed some light on um, sort of the legal background for you know it's not just software necessarily that's preventing repair, um, but but a, a certain type of law that protects software um, um, that that acts together with the technical restriction to create a pretty potent um, um, impediment to repair. So um, so I'll just briefly what I'll go over is just the overview of the EU copyright law framework, which which applies to software. Um, and I, that will lead into the two types of TPMs that we have in the EU. Uh, and then uh, briefly, I'll touch upon embedded systems and TPMs and repair and, and why um, or how we are seeing TPMs being used um, across many more things than, than traditionally envisioned back in the, the late 1990s, and then some steps towards solutions. And I won't profess to, to have all of the solutions, but maybe some just some ideas of directions that we could go to, to, to start to um, make repairability more um, in the reach of most people, including Stefan. Okay, so there are a lot of copyright directives in the EU, a lot of directives that touch upon copyright, and there's no single source of copyright law. And, you know, most states around the world will have a copyright act, and it's more or less comprehensive. The EU does not follow this approach, and there are 11 or perhaps more directives touching upon it. But for the purposes of today, we're really going to look at two of them that touch upon TPMs in, in an, an important way that uh, has to do with software and, and embedded systems in, in products and devices. And the first is the Computer Programs Directive. It's a very old directive. Um, and the second is the Information Society Directive. Um, okay, and so the Computer Programs Directive protects, as it says, computer programs by copyright as literary works um, and to the expression in any form of a computer program. And it defines a computer program um, as, uh, well, as including any form um, and those are which are incorporated into hardware. And so the Information Society Directive, a totally different uh, copyright directive, is really an attempt to harmonize copyright and related rights for, for more of the traditional things that we consider to be copyright works like music and film and books. Um, but they both apply to TPMs and this creates a kind of a difficulty that I will get into when, when it comes to TPM policy. So what are TPMs? Um, TPMs mean really any technology device or component. So it's extraordinarily broad um, that prevent or restrict acts um, that are essentially infringing of copyright or not authorized by copyright holders. And so, and there's this language of effective that they have to be an effective TPM to be protected. Um, and so it, it essentially is a copy, uh, copy protection or access control. Um, so it uses some examples in the InfoSoc directive of encryption, scrambling, or some type of copy control mechanism. Um, and the Computer Programs Directive, it defines TPMs almost not at all, but just very briefly, it says that it's any technical device which is applied to protect a computer program. So in both cases, there's an extraordinarily broad definition of what a TPM could be. There's not, there are not a lot of technical restrictions on what a manufacturer can, um, what they can call a TPM. 
So some classic TPM examples that um, maybe might be familiar to some are, you know, a content scrambling system that we saw in DVDs, which prevented copy restriction between two DVDs. Um, so in more modern terms, we have the Amazon Kindle with digital rights management. This prevents, um, this, this prevents essentially is a software TPM, but it prevents the use of non-authorized um, eBooks on an Amazon Kindle. So ones that you did not buy from Amazon. Um, another familiar example, maybe hearkening back to the, you know, the last 10 years are serial keys for software. Often we'll buy software and it will come with an, a, a serial key that, that is for your license to use the, 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 the software. And that, that is an example of uh, one type of TPM. And then more modern approach would be over the air authentication. So um, this, is a, this is a connection between your use of the software, your device and the server um, somewhere else that, that authenticates the program and will provide for example, updates or, or patches. These are all classic TPM examples. Um, but we're seeing kind of now more of a foray into uh, ambiguous TPMs, maybe we'll call them, because we're not really sure um, how to classify them. So the rise of embedded system design, onboard computers of all kinds of IoT devices now, everything from you know, agricultural machinery to toothbrushes to you know, kitchen appliances, everything is now essentially a very, um, a very specifically designed computer for, for a specific purpose. And computers by their nature, um, whether they're in a, in a hairdryer or in a toaster or a, an agricultural machine are, are, are general purpose devices, right? They can be for the most part um, programmed to do all sorts of things, but manufacturers will apply restrictions that narrow their application or their use to very narrow use activities. And one of which can, can impede repair. But so when we see these um, modern implications of, of TPMs, there is, like I said, agricultural machinery, there's a Keurig coffee machine that, only, uh, that will only allow a uh, coffee pod produced by Keurig to be used in it. There's the, the classic McDonald's um, milkshake machine that is constantly breaking down that has a security code that will only provide the franchise owner of the McDonald's um, knowledge of what's wrong with the machine if it's approved first by the manufacturer. Uh, and then we've seen the Kitsch device, which was used to circumvent this. Then um, there's also the, the classic error 53 code from the iPhone, which if the screen was replaced, um, including the fingerprint sensor on the iPhone 8 series of devices, um, then by an unauthorized non-Apple repairer, um, then this would, the next time it was plugged into a computer for a software update, um, it would brick the device. So in, in other words, it just wouldn't work at all anymore. So another example of, of a TPM restricting device functionality. And so in these, all these cases, it's really unclear whether the TPM is protecting a computer program, in which case the computer programs directive would apply, um, the functions of the device. So purely just to restrict the functionality in some way that the manufacturer wants, or it's restricting, um, you know, infringing activity under copyright law. So protecting some type of entertainment or creative media. Um, so in the example of the iPhone, you know, could you argue that that is more protecting a, um, you know, an expressive creative work, film or media, or is it protecting a computer program? So we have this kind of really um, strange uh, conundrum where we, we have to classify TPMs and it's not always clear what type of TPMs they are. So I think Stefan really um, touched upon this and I won't go over it in too, too much detail, but circumventing TPMs can be really important on these devices. So for example, to obtain diagnostic information, to activate replacement parts, to enable non-OEM parts, so third-party parts to operate with the device to correct errors. And so in most cases um, for repair purposes, these acts of circumvention of the TPM, so going around them in some way, don't really reproduce the software or infringe upon copyright, but they just have to get around the TPM some way. But the way that TPM rules work under copyright law, whether they're under the copyright directive or the InfoSoc directive, uh, sorry, the, the computer programs directive or the InfoSoc directive is that circumventing them is the unlawful act. For, you know, it's not really about what your, your purpose is of circumvention. It's, it's the circumvention itself is the unlawful activity. So if we look at the information society directive, it says, um, it, it creates this two-tiered re regime for TPMs. So it says uh, the, info, the InfoSoc Directive does not apply to TPMs um, in connection with computer pro programs, which is exclusively addressed by the Computer Programs Directive. Um, and it also, it also makes clear that the InfoSoc Directive, despite becoming, you know, 10 years later, will no way, you know, affect or, or, or remind the rules set in the Computer Programs Directive. So this this here just kind of sets this clear two-tiered, completely inconsequential framework for TPMs in the EU. 
And again, this is where it gets kind of awkward for things that we're not quite sure what type of TPM they are. And, and those who lived long enough now to remember uh, the Super Nintendo um, will remember that they, perhaps there were two different types of cartridges. They were designed to different shapes for different regions. Um, so one was for the, uh, the Pacific and European region. Um, so that the top one there would be the European Super Nintendo cartridge and the bottom one would be the North American one. And this was to prevent you know, distribution of these cartridges across the world that was unauthorized by Nintendo because they wanted to set prices, right, for different regions. Um, and so this is an example of, is this, this is a TPM, right? Because it's a function that, that controls access to a work for a certain region under copyright. Um, now, is it protecting a computer program um, or is it protecting um, some other type of expressive or creative work like a video game in terms of its, its music or its animation? Um, it's not clear. Um, um, and another, another more modern case is the Nintendo 3DS, right? That's got a, uh, uh, you know, there, there's a way to circumvent the, the, the DRM, essentially the TPMs in that device to allow you to play non-authorized games. And again, is this, is this protecting a computer program in the case of a video game or some other type of copyright? So um, the computer programs directive uh, really like this is, this is its, this is its prohibition on um, preventing circumvention, but most importantly, the computer programs directive um, makes unlawful putting into circulation or possessing for the commercial purposes, any means of circumventing. So if you have, for example, like that, that Nintendo 3DS um, um, cartridge that, that can enable you to play non-authorized works or not authorized games, um, it's putting that into circulation, selling it or offering it is really the unlawful act of the computer programs directive. And, and that directive also makes clear that member states can, um, can have laws that, that seize in using border measures, um, uh, any, anything like that. Um, the InfoSoc directive makes clear that, uh, that really circumvention is unlawful uh, and that uh, the manufacture import or distribution of, of circumvention tools um, are also uh, unlawful. And so uh, there, there are kind of two approaches to exceptions in these directives as well. One is more restrictive and one offers maybe more opportunity um, for, for you know, uh, exceptions and limitations. So the computer programs directive um, really only in its preamble, so not in its, not an actual provision of the directive says that um, a person that has a right to use the computer program should not be prevented from performing acts necessary to observe, study or test. So that's the closest we come to repair in the computer programs directive. In the information society directive, um, we have again in the recitals, um, some mention that TPMs um, legal protection for them should not prevent the normal operation of electronic equipment. Again, this is just a recital, it's not a hard provision. Uh, and then again, in recital 50, um, that TPMs should not prevent, um, should not really get in the way of exceptions or limitations um, to copyright. So if you think about it, like the Information Society Directive is maybe a better vehicle for finding a way that repair could be uh, included as, as a means for circumventing TPMs. But it's really not clear in every case that the type of TPM we're dealing with is a computer program one or an Information Society direct, uh, TPM. So again, so the InfoSoc has this really robust framework for exceptions and limitations in Article 5.3 and one of which, which I've just written a, a paper on uh, in GP Tech, um, is this really underutilized exception where it says that member states may provide for additional exceptions or limitations to copyright in the case of use in connection with the repair or demonstration of equipment. Um, this has never been interpreted by the CJU. We don't really know um, exactly what is meant by this provision, only just what has been implemented by a handful of member states. Um, um, and so there's maybe some opportunity here for for um, finding a way to get around sort of this very um, draconian view of TPMs that, that would allow repair of, of devices. But again, not applying necessarily to computer programs. Um, so the computer programs directive only really has that really brief reference to a narrow private exception um, for you know, testing um, and diagnosis. Um, there's no explicit reception, uh, exception for repair. The word repair does not appear anywhere in the computer programs directive. Um, or for reverse engineering or diagnosis. And so really it comes down to how we could interpret, observe, study, or test in the computer programs directive. Does that include repair activities? We have no guidance um, for this. 
so so it's towards some solutions and and i i think that this is maybe the real value add in having me join you today and um so I think the starting point is that we need much more technical and legal research on TPMs period within the EU. So what type of technical measures protect computer programs and which do not, you know, we need to develop some technical standards and classifications of them based on their manner of inter uh, implementation and the works that they protect. So right now it's, it's everything from, like I said, the shape of that Nintendo cartridge to encryption um, to, you know, uh, uh, like a, a, a a key code that would authenticate software. So it, it's, it's such a broad concept of, um, of the, the technical function of a TPM that it's really difficult for us to, to classify and understand them. And I mean, I think maybe more of a legal research question is, should we consider TPMs effective within the meaning of, of, of both the, the InfoSoc directive and the computer programs directive? Uh, if their sole purpose is really to restrict the utilitarian function of a device, you know, if, if the sole purpose of that TPM is just to prevent a repair or prevent interoperability or some other type of non-infringing activity, you know, should we consider this effective? Um, and we also need some more judicial interpretation. So the repair exception in the InfoSoc directive, as as maybe inapplicable as it could as it could otherwise be to computer programs, um, it it needs analysis and interpretation by both the European Commission and the CJU. I've, I've done my best in a recent article to kind of um, um, perform the best analysis and interpretation I can based on the sources that, I, that I'm able to, to find. But I think some, some analysis and guidance from, from a lawmaking authority or, or administrative body would be particularly helpful for repairers on the ground. Um, and so, and another question is, you know, to what extent can that exception influence the interpretation of other directives? You know, so may, maybe some broader interpretation of of that um, may influence how we interpret that that kind of small window that's left open in the computer programs directive. Um, and again, can the definition of an effective TPM be narrowed to exclude those TPMs um, which serve only to to limit utilitarian function or repair of devices? Some member state implementation would also be helpful. Um, so Article 5.3L, this repair exception in the InfoSoc directive. If there was some more effort towards implementing it among member states, I think that would require um, that would require more analysis and interpretation of what it means. Currently, only ten member states have implemented it um, with very widely um, wide ranging um, approaches. You know, some very restrictive and allowing it to to um, to a blanket exception to all copyright for repair of any device, and some very narrow, saying it's you know it's only for um, it you know it's only for very narrow purposes of repairing certain types of equipment. Um, that are displayed, for example, in a, in a shop um, window. You know, so, so there's very different approaches to it. Um, so that, that would help if there was some more effort among member states. And um, some more legislative and, uh, and policy intervention at the EU level, so maybe more top-down um, so ideas for, for amending directives or, or, or issuing new, new policy guidance would be, for one, to require rights holders to provide notice to device owners of, that there are TPMs incorporated into its design. And to make explicit, you know, what what functions or activities the TPM serves to restrict, and this would give us all a better understanding of, you know, what what is being implemented and why. Uh, and of course, in order to get to that point, we need more research on the whole, you know, the different types of TPMs and and um, and their manner of interpretation impl implementation. Um, the second is maybe to make it explicit that device and product owners have an implied license to use a computer program. Um, so. When you buy the device, uh, it's not clear. You know there there are there are terms of service that come attached to your use of it, um, and maybe you know maybe there could be some legislative intervention to make it clear that when you buy a device, you have an implied license to use any computer programs or software that are required to make it function normally. Um, this this may help us get around some of some of the issues about um, um, who is you know what what rights the the device owner has to circumvent the TPM or to access the underlying um, software as a copyright work. Um, third, you know, tasking the administrative body with a periodic review of TPM implementation, um, this would be really helpful. We don't have anything like this in the EU currently, but the closest um, example would be the United States, which has, you know, a periodic review of certain products and devices and issues case by case exemptions. Um, it's a very, you know, time intensive and, and detailed process, but it's, it's, a way of, uh, it's a way of sort of bringing forward the worst offenders and making sure there are clear exceptions for them. Um, and finally, you know, the European Commission and, uh, and competition authorities should really um, 
really address this from, from the perspective of competition law in addition to just um, IP policy or consumer protection. I and mean, we should really be looking at the way that um, the use of TPMs in certain products by manufacturers are preventing secondary markets like independent repair um, from operating and, and how this is really an abuse of a dominant position. Um, and so, you know, when you restrict, if, if you make a product and you're, and you're in the business of selling that product, um, that doesn't necessarily give you the ability to, to use some sort of design feature to prevent others from offering products or services that, that are in a completely uh, secondary market. And so, and so some maybe some more clear guidance about that relationship between secondary markets and the use of IP as a restriction or a bottleneck um, would, be, would be very helpful. Okay, so that's, um, that's my... Uh, that's my maybe long-winded or, or not um, explanation of, of TPMs in the EU. And I'm, I'm happy to take any questions after the others have had a chance to, to speak. Uh, thanks, thanks very much. Just um, maybe I'm gonna just slip a quick, quick question in uh, just because this is quite straightforward. Uh, someone asked is, would, uh, uh, would, would it be TPM related when printer maker HP blocks the entire machine if you use non-HP branded replacement cartridges? I would say text, textbook example, but I'll, I'll let you answer. Yes, I mean, simple answer is yes. And, and there's actually a famous decision from the United States um, called Lex, Lexmark and Static Control Components um, that, that really was one of the foundational cases about embedded computer systems and TPMs and printer cartridges were the, the classic example. And the Keurig coffee machine is, is no different, you know, with the, the, the pods that have to be authorized by Keurig. Absolutely. So thanks so much. I can, I can feel the audience get, uh, getting a little bit outraged and um, I can definitely understand. Um, this is partly also uh, what, what we are here for. Thank you so much, uh, Anthony, also for making it clear why the current um, repair exemption within one of the directives that you were talking about does not is not does not even get close to covering the issue for everyone who is a little bit confused uh with we sympathize this is this is not easy this is very complicated and i would say this is also part of the problem if it is this complicated for people that are putting this much effort into understanding how can we expect uh, repair professionals that have you know have another kind of job to to go through all of this um, so thanks very much for, for this contribution. Um, I see that our next speaker um, uh, still has some uh, technical troubles. So I would maybe um, hop over uh, her mo momentarily, just for the moment, and uh, give the floor to Anne-Catherine Laurent. Uh, Anne-Catherine Laurent is political advisor on legal affairs, which is the jury committee of the European Parliament for the group, political group within the European Parliament of the Greens EFA group. And from, from her, we wanted to hear, we would like to, to have a policymaker's perspective on this. So we have presented the issue. We, from a very practical perspective and we have heard from a legal perspective. So what could we say from a policymaker's perspective? What, how could you respond to the demands, also the proposals that Anthony has put forward um, from, from your perspective within the European Parliament? Hi everyone, I hope you can hear me. Yes, great. Um, well, thanks for having me and thanks for the great presentations that were made so far. This is really good food for thought. Um, I know that many of my colleagues are in touch with you to no, notably to work on this global campaign on the right to repair. Um, so I have no, no slides to, to, to share because I understand my, react, my, uh, my intervention is more meant to, to be a reaction to what has been said. And I'm looking forward to the presentation that will be made uh, after me. Um, 
so saying that IP copyright can be an impediment to uh, the right to repair and to the green transition, uh, more generally speaking, is kind of taboo uh, among lawmakers, at least in the European Parliament. Um, Besides, such connection is quite difficult to, to make, technically speaking, in our work uh, within the institutions and within the parliament more specifically, because you have the INCO committee in the parliament, uh, uh, competent on consumer affairs, internal market, uh, which has competence, which is lead on almost everything dealing with consumer rights. And then you have the jury committee on legal affairs, uh, which is not really working on that or more indirectly, uh, which has uh, exclusive competence on anything dealing with IP law and copyright. So INCO and jury used to be the same committee until the early 2000s and notably until the negotiation on the e-commerce directive. And since then they have parted. And then we are kind of entangled in um, a lot of conflicts of competences. And if IMCO does not have a clear message towards jury then that IP law should be uh, amended or adapted, and to my knowledge, IMCO has not conveyed such mes message so far, then jury will probably not react uh, upon that. And at the end of the day, jury would have the final word on anything um, dealing with uh, with IP law. So we're a bit blocked. That's why the taboo is more um, actually a kind of silence on the issue of, of IP and copyright being an impediment to, to, to repair and to the green transition. Although we're trying to do that in our amendments, but most of the time we have no majorities to, to convey that message in, in the final uh, resolutions in, in the parliament. Um, so there are new pieces of legislation coming up, um, but they are so specialized uh, in consumer protection on specific categories of products that jury competent on IP will probably never have a say on that, unless maybe we decide to do something. But again, I doubt we will have a majority, political majority in jury to, to do so. And very concretely, um, uh, you've of course heard about this recent directive a proposal empowering consumers for the green transition through better protection against unfair practices and better information. Well, jury has decided not to issue an opinion on that. So INCO will be lead, jury will not intervene, although jury could potentially do it. It was at the time a few months ago on the list of possible opinions, but there was no majority to work on that which was a pity. Um, and this is a bit surprising because jury uh, still has competence on unfair practices from the contract angle. So it would be logical that jury would have a say on it, but it was decided not to do so. So shall we fix copyright law? Um, for this, we would have to wait uh, for a future review again of uh, copyright directive. I'm not sure that we're ready to do that again because we have already done so uh, in 2019 with the copyright directive um, on the digital single market, which was partially reviewing the InfoSoc directive of 2001. And I would maybe have two uh, remarks, but Anthony uh, already made uh, a great presentation that, that, that is already more detailed, but how, shall we make, for instance, the criteria to grant copyright protection higher? And I'm here thinking about the example of repair manuals. It's true that many of them, because the bar to access copyright protection can be pretty low. And by the mere fact that repair manuals exist where they can potentially claim and be granted uh, copyright protection, this kind of core change in copyright law can only be done at international or, at, or European level. So it's uh, there is territoriality of copyright, but the margin uh, for departing from the core copyright law principles, such as originality or access to copyright protection, um, this margin does basically does not exist um, at national level. And we cannot take the initiative to do that, at least uh, from the, from the well, as a legislator in the European Parliament, it's, it's difficult to do it, but we have tried. 
We have proposed in some amendments and in draft reports in the past mandate, uh, you might remember the draft, the report of Julia Reda uh, on the implementation of the InfoSoc directive that was adopted in 2016. We had proposed to, um, to ask for a mandatory registration of works, which would by definition discourage the application for protection and then automatically uh, reduce the number of here repair manuals to be protected by copyright. But again, as you can imagine, um, as this runs against the spirit of the core copyright principles, I have to say, because I'm an IP lawyer too, so I, I know it's difficult to, to push for this kind of proposal. It's very dairy. Uh, and as you can imagine, there was no political majority for that, and there is still no political majority for that. So it's very difficult to move uh, on this. Then about the repair exception that is uh, provided uh, by the InfoSoc directive, uh, how shall we make this exception mandatory? As already mentioned uh, by Anthony, um, it's not too late for member states to make this exception mandatory in their domestic laws. And the more member states uh, make the step to do so, maybe we can reach an impetus to, to do so, but it also depends on us in various pieces of legislation at European level to send the message that yes, IP law should, should allow this or there should not be legal barriers, again, the right to repair. So maybe little by little, in various places, at, in different pieces of legislation, we could build on this kind of impetus and probably encourage member states to make the exception for repair mandatory and consistent with a more um, solid and robust uh, approach uh, harmonized through our member states. Maybe that's a dream, but it's, it's possible. It depends on the political in impetus. Um, and in all upcoming legislations, we, we have to assert that legal barriers, such as the ones based on exclusive rights, it's copyright, but also other IPR, uh, such as patents, trademarks, designs, but also trade secrets, uh, should be removed in order to, to enable repair of products, products being, of course, legally owned. Um, and I would also like to mention the prohibition of contractual override. Uh, this is indeed key in making exceptions work in real life, that basically exceptions should not be circumvented by contracts. So we have introduced this in the copyright directive in 2019, but this does not concern uh, the exception for repair. It's a blanket provision in the 2019 directive, but only against uh, contract override concerning text and data mining, uh, digital and cross-border teaching activities, and uh, preservation of cultural heritage. But still, it's good to notice that the idea of preventing um, contractual override is in the air, as in enshrined, at least in this um, latest directive on copyright. This is still something. And last but not least, I would like to uh, draw your attention uh, on the Data Act proposal, which is going to be a key instrument for anything being um, Internet of Things. We are only starting to work on that in the EP. We haven't finalized our amendments, so we are happy to, to collaborate and gather uh, ideas to, to work uh, on amendments. Um, and several uh, intellectual property rights are concerned uh, in the Data Act proposal. Well, first of all, we have the right on databases. And the Data Act proposal clearly says that the so-called sui generis rights on databases should not apply to databases containing data obtained from, from or generated by the use of a connected device. This is very clear, but still we have to ensure that this is really the case and reinforce the wording in the regulation, thus the importance of our amendments. And there are several studies, including, including conducted by the commission, who have shown that the uh, database directive would uh, need to be uh, updated. Then the Data Act limits data sharing and interoperability in referring to another subcategory of IP rights I was referring to earlier, trade secrets. 
Um, so there we have to be sure that um, trade secrets cannot be simply claimed like this by the industry. You have conditions provided by the trade secrets directive and you also have exceptions to allow access to uh, data information uh, protected by, by trade secrets. So the trick is while respecting trade secrets when they are proportionate, of course, um, we should still allow for their communication, um, the, con the communication, the sharing of the information concerned by trade secrets while still guaranteeing that um, the data are kept confidential. So this would be uh, a solution that we hope uh, we could uh, we could reach, and then I would uh, finally refer to technical protection measures, which are also um, mentioned uh, in the Data Act. And there is something important that the proposal is saying in its Article 11, uh, first paragraph, which prohibits data holders to use uh, technical protection measures designed to prevent unauthorized access to data to hinder the user's right to effectively provide data to, to third par parties. So basically, technical protection measures that would prevent uh, data sharing and interoperability. And this prohibition uh, to abuse TPMs is absolutely key um, in the context of the right to repair. And we've been talking, for instance, to the um, automotive uh, car industry and also repair uh, people saying that this prohibition is absolutely key. And then we have to make sure that these TPMs, because they're, they're referred to by the Data Act as something very general in a broad meaning, that they are not themselves protected by IPR. So we plan to table additional uh, amendments just to, to clarify that we don't want TPMs not only to be abused, but to, to be granted uh, protection that the commission would not have thought to, but we're sure that the industry uh, will come up with, uh, with bright ideas to, to in that direction. And I will finish, and that's my last point, about open source software. Uh, I think it's important to remind that open source software should not uh, be bound by exactly the same level of obligations in, in legislation. And we have already done so in the directive on contracts um, for the provision of digital content, where you have something specific on open source saying that they have they should not obey exactly the same uh, obligations, thanks to our amendments. Um, and then in the general product safety regulation, in the jury opinion, we have something good as well on open source uh, content and products. Uh, and in the jury opinion on the AI Act, Act on Artificial Intelligence, we also have specific uh, article or paragraph on, on open source. Uh, so it's good that the idea is, you know, there in some parts of legislation saying that, okay, you can have different kinds of software that are not protected by copyright and they should obey different kinds of, uh, of obligation. So I would stop here. I'm happy to share some speaking notes if uh, some people would uh, would like to and to answer further questions. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Anne Catherine, for this perspective. Um, I think your presentation has shown how um, scattered also copyright law can can be, meaning that it's very difficult to find. Uh, one piece of legislation that can be amended once and for all and that will cover the topic and 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 we will be done with it it's um it's uh, it's it's quite uh difficult to 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 follow it from an external eye and and this is and this is why i think even though it's difficult to talk about for instance a review of the, of the different copyright directives once more I think this is why it's it's still important to point out that this is a problem that we have from the repair perspective as well, because as much as we are working on repair from different perspectives, there is there are always some big chunks of problems that escape us. Uh, and the, I could see in the chat uh, some questions about different types of uh, of products uh, licenses 
and 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 also since you since you mentioned it the the car industry which is a good example of a, a big repair market but where a lot of unfair practices definitely uh, go on um i would now give the floor since i think it's it's pretty nicely in the flow of, of what you were saying about repair information, repair manuals, to Laura da Silva from Knowledge Rights uh, 21, because I think she can she can continue a little bit this uh, a little bit this debate about manuals, ac access to to information. And uh, like this, we are starting our more interactive phase. You have the floor, Laura. Thank you, and uh, thank you to everyone who, who spoke um, earlier, really super insightful information and very useful for me in the future. And I also want to thank to the Right to Repair campaign for organizing this, especially Christina and Orla. Um, so why are we interested in this? Uh, our main focus at Knowledge Rights 21 is you know, to ensure that copyright laws and policies are aligned with the importance of rights to research, education, access to culture, and we believe that this um, is in line with other European goals as well, other priorities, namely right to repair and the right to repair goes beyond um, just environmental issues or consumer issues. So there's many things that Stefan Anthony and, and Katrin mentioned about uh, software issues, technical protection measures. Um, they're problematic, but there's also a big problem um, more widely, uh, for example, with the infamous uh, threats to prosecute iFix, uh, which is a platform online that um, shared uh, information on how to fix medical devices. I think this is a really a good example on how copyright is not serving public interest, because when in 2020, in the middle of a pandemic, um, a platform sharing on how to fix a medical device um, is potentially facing prosecution, um, there's probably a problem and we need to, to, to deal with that. Um, other countries are also talking about right to repair. Uh, United States is slightly more advanced than we are on this, which is not something we can say every day. Um, they've better established, although limited provisions in our repair, um, especially on the side of contract terms, which, uh, no, well, I'm sorry, contract terms um, can often still stand it away, but they have uh, at least clear exemption rules around the removal of digital locks and digital blocks. So in the end, access to information is really a big essential part of, of this whole discussion that we have here today, whether that is access, access on how to fix something or information within the device, with such as software. And so on this note, I have uh, a couple, I have actually several questions, but I'll start with a couple of questions. Um, and the first being actually specifically on manuals, which are often protected by copyright, but also not just the manuals in itself, but copyright can also be triggered when sharing code or other material and to teach others on how to repair. And so, how effective are European rules in the end in assuring that we can access this uh, repair information? And um, on contract override mentioned by Anne Catherine, but others as well, um, I, my, my interpretation of it is that this leaves um, consumers right now in Europe bound by licensing terms that can in many ways um, be, can lose their rights in a way, um, not only on right to repair, but also the other rights. Um, Ireland has a, a blanket contract override provision. Um, and so I was wondering if it would make sense to have something similar in Europe, all over Europe. And what would that look like? Is it doable? So I'd be happy to hear from you on all of this, but and also other things if we have the time, but. Thanks very much, Laura, for these first questions that are quite legal, I would say, quite policy oriented. So I would be happy to hear maybe from Anthony 
uh, or from Anne Catherine on these two questions about policy solutions. Um, I wonder whether either either of you, Anne Catherine or Anthony, would like to answer. I see Anthony. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't have a, a lot to say about contractual override and manuals, but um, I think we, so the eco design directive, um, it's 2019 implementing regulations address access to repair information. It doesn't call it manuals, it calls it repair information. And I, I guess I would say briefly that, that, and I think for the reasons that Anne Katrine mentioned, th these, these regulations are, are uh, these implementing regulations are inadequate because they, they require uh, manufacturers to provide access to repair information to independent repairers um, who are considered professional, you know, for for a fee, <laughs> and and so it essentially leaves a lot of um, control in the hands of manufacturers of um, determining who is a professional repairer and the terms upon which they can have access to that information. And most importantly, and I, and I think again, based on what Ankutin said, there's you know it doesn't really affect copyright or IP rights in the repair information. So. Um, you know, because these sort of operate in distinct silos, the consumer protection and IP policy within the EU, we 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 don't see a lot of um, um, connection between access to repair information and and IP policy. Um, so uh, so I guess this is where perhaps the Infosoc directives repair exception might play a role. But again, um, you know, there as, as I mentioned before, there's a bunch of reasons why we there's maybe limited mileage we could get out of out of that exception and under the current circumstances. And maybe just to, to complement very quickly, um, we also need case law, uh, judicial interpretation, as also Anthony mentioned earlier. Um, and as long as it's not explicitly written in, in law that there should not be a contractual override of, of an exception, then it's difficult to, to, to do more. Um, so we need more, more, more case law on that. So maybe what one day, um, or maybe at national level, um, there could be again this impetus to 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 change things. But so far, it's difficult to 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 make things different. Thank you very much for for these answers. We need more case law, more clear definitions, um, more more clarifications. That's that's for sure. Uh, thank you very much for. Um, everyone that contributed to this uh, pretty legal part of the debate. And uh, now I would like to give the floor to uh, Deborah Gull. Um, she represents a slightly um, different point of view, I would say. Uh, she represents the European Digital SME Alliance. So basically European Digital SMEs. And um, we already had a few talks about this, and we were wondering whether, Deborah, you could share a little bit uh, what all of this means, also in terms of uh, market competition. Uh, Anthony was talking about an abusive and dominant position also in secondary markets uh, from the OEM perspective. And we are wondering a little bit, what does this mean for uh, European digital SMEs? And also we are looking forward to your uh, questions for the debate. Thank you very much, Christina. Um, thank you for organizing this event. It's very interesting to see uh, how Right Reaper is uh, interlinked with IP law as well as competition law. So um, yes, at the European Digital SME Alliance, we, we have been saying indeed that um, the right to repair should also uh, include the right to update software as well as the right to innovate. And indeed, it's also key to uh, the European digital sovereignty as well as sustainable digitalization, which is mainly uh, based or relies on, on the strong SME ecosystem in, in the EU. Because um, in the EU, we have 99% uh, of all companies which are small companies or medium-sized companies. So we are, we are relying, rely, relying on them to, um, to lead Europe to, to be more sovereign in, in, the, in the ICT sector and also to make the ICT sector more sustainable. 
And um, so SMEs, mainly due to the global prices for hardware, are mostly innovating in the software sector. And this means that they are relying on, the, on hardware, which is manufactured by, by third party companies. And, and to be able to innovate in the software, uh, software sector, they need um, a certain degree of openness of, of this hardware. And uh, as was already mentioned by, by the previous speakers, uh, most of the hardware parts in, in the electronics, in the cars, in the white goods, uh, I think washing machines were, were mentioned in, in the first end of contribution. They all run on a firmware which is owned by the manufacturer and it locks uh, access to any third party provider, uh, service provider who would be able to, to uh, update, uh, for instance, uh, um, the software or firmware to make it more sustainable or to make it last longer, uh, to extend the, the life cycle of the, of the products and, and also to increase uh, innovation um, in, the, in, in the EU market. This is why we are calling on, on the EU regulators to support openness, uh, both in software, but also in hardware. And um, so for SMEs to be able to build on the work uh, from, from others and, and to provide services. And we also need more clarity uh, for copyright, as was uh, mentioned uh, before, um, because the fear of committing copyright infringements is, is high. So this also prevents or is a limitation for companies who don't really um, dare to, to uh, innovate or to uh, in, the, in, this, in the software sector. And it's also very difficult um, among this uh, jungle to, to find information about the copyright holders, how the software is licensed. Um, this is why we're also closely working with the EU IPO, the EU Office for Inter Intellectual Property uh, Office, um, to inform SMEs uh, on, on uh, how, how they can make the most of, of it. And um, yes, one. One solution would be to adapt the, 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 the regulatory framework, but indeed, as uh, anne Catherine was mentioning before, uh, it seems a bit difficult uh, right now since it has been updated um, in 20, 2019. And perhaps the last remark to show how, how also it's a global problem and not only to uh, related to copyright, but also to competition. Um, when we look at the um, big tech gatekeepers uh, providing applications on the smartphones and um, and um, making their own applications uh, as default, it uh, prevents uh, also um, other companies to um, to provide applications which which perhaps would be more energy efficient um, and also um, it gives. It has little incentive for these gatekeepers. They know they, have, they, they will be as default uh, installed on all the devices um, to improve themselves, their applications or software, because they, they know they will have the users and uh, could be a bit lazy. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for your perspective as well, uh, Deborah. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, really great to have all of these different uh, points of view on, on this issue that is so complex. Uh, and uh, I think both your intervention and Stefan's intervention were highlighting how this has consequences of also from a market competition point of view, as you were uh, highlighting as well. Um, we have a lot of questions, but we are a little bit running out of time. Uh, we um, expect we have. I would maybe start with uh, one that was originally. Um, at, uh, I think it was originally asked to Stefan, but could probably could probably interest also other speakers. Um, which is, are you looking to blueprint the car markets like? captive parts and what I believe they mean is the motor vehicle block exemption regulation. Um, 
the, the car market is uh, definitely uh, a, a big, big question, uh, but I just wanted to mention it as I saw that, um, as I saw that it was uh, talked about in, uh, in the chat. So I don't know if Stefan, you have something to say about this? Yeah, sure. Uh, because the car market is a uh, like a uh, um, yeah positive uh, example for uh, how the things can work out. Um, but we have some big differences between the car market and the electronic goods market. It's not only the the the, the big difference in the price and so the interest, but um, there's also a, a big difference because in the car market we have very strong. Um, manufacturers or, or traders of uh, spare parts um, not the oem or not the original manufacturer and this is uh, different from the electronic goods market because um we have on the we have the most of the production in europe so the all all the deliverers they are also in europe and in the electronic market we have the um, uh, a lot of uh, manufacturers out of europe and so that uh, the also the the pre-deliverers are not uh, uh, you know, in Europe, and they are not uh, as powerful as uh, in, uh, on the car market. So, um, but I think it's a it's a good example how how the things things work. So the the car market, um, I think it was by ATU, which is a big German um, spare part and 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 accessory trader, and and they do uh, billions of euros every year. Um, in the turnover, so they are powerful and uh, they can fight the the big industry. Um, there's also a, a good connection between the repair shops and the the independent repair shops on the auto market, um, which is completely different from the situation on the electronic market because we have only these really really small uh, workshops. Um, they are not good connected and. Uh, not even in inner German, uh, but uh, yeah, you can imagine how it is in, uh, European. And we are not even in our um, handcrafters chamber uh, a powerful handcrafter because we have uh, yeah no no power also inside the the um, yeah the the hand handcrafters organization. So. Um, yeah, we need the support of of like everyone, like uh, the the um, yeah the the environmental environmental uh, people. They they want to save the environment because I think they are strong in Europe and they are strong in in the German uh, uh, politics, and um, we need these strong voices to support us. But I think we're always talking about the the circular econ economy. But it's 90 to 95 percent. It's about recycling and reuse. But uh, the repair is forgotten uh, so often. And I hope uh, yeah, we, as a as a as a movement or as a community, we can can change this and orient on the uh, orientate on the um, on the car market. I think it's they have a lot achieved that uh, we need to achieve. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for this answer, Stefan, which also enables me to uh, touch upon another comment or question that we saw in the chat, which was, you touched upon competition and others, but what about the environment? Um, I would um, like to stress that the right to repair campaign uh, aim, I would say the first aim is to uh, protect the environment and to address the environmental and climate crisis. This is our um, goal, definitely. This is why we are advocating for repair, to keep the products uh, in use as long as possible to prolong the life of our devices, because we know that um, up to 80% of the environmental footprint of our electronic devices is produced in the manufacturing producing phase and not really while we use them. So to throw them away prematurely is just absolute nonsense. So this is absolutely, I would say, the very first preoccupation that we have in the right to repair uh, movement. And I would say this is, uh, 
clear for everyone. Um, we wanted to also highlight other aspects um, that are linked to this, because I believe that uh, when we talk about repair and reuse, um, many policymakers um, think about the environment, but they do not necessarily think of it also as a uh, as as a business model, because it can be also another way to uh, provide a service as many of our um, many of our uh, partners uh, could could tell you um, now I would like to go back to uh, another more legal legal question uh, which is a very difficult question again for Anthony and, and, and Anne Catherine which is how would a permanent exemption to TPMs for any activity related to repair, reuse, and extension of lifetime waste prevention could work. Uh, how could a permanent exemption to TPMs work? What kind of overarching piece of legislation should, um, should be written in order to achieve this? Um, and also a, a general a general message. Uh, we still have a lot of questions, so we're probably gonna go on a little bit longer than than foreseen. But if uh, if participants have to leave, absolutely by all means, thanks for um, thanks that you joined. So uh, now we can give the floor to Anthony for this very difficult question. What kind of overarching piece of legislation would we need for a permanent exemption to TPMs for activities related to repair, reuse, and extension of lifetime waste prevention? Well, I, I, I don't like to be too difficult, but I think the answer might be that it's there might not be one single overarching solution. Uh, and, and for the reasons that I think I tried to outline in my presentation that, you know, currently TPM policy in the EU is, is bifurcated or, or kept in separate compartments in a strange way that distinguishes computer programs from everything else. And so to have one um, permanent exemption for TPM circumvention for repair activities is difficult because already we have, we're dealing with at least two different directives um, that touch upon the subject. Um, so. Uh, from a lawmaking perspective, I mean, I, I, uh, I think that Anne Katrine would be in a better position to, to, sort of comment on exactly the the mechanism for for approaching a comprehensive solution, um, but I think the nature of the of the fact that currently we have these two concepts of TPMs that are seem to be inconsequential creates a really difficult framework um, for us to have one one legislative sweep that would just take care of the problem. Yes, I can only concur with that. Um, in a way, you, you can already have an overarching legislation according to the hierarchy of norms. Well, it would be the uh, Convention on Human Rights, but then we need to be amended, amended saying that nothing should impede uh, the green transition. I don't know how it should be worded, but you know what I mean? So it's very difficult to put in place anyway. Uh, so again, case law can only help to reinforce the message. Um, and then via different pieces of legislation, as we have already already said before. Uh, and the latest example is the Data Act proposal that I, that I have referred to. There, there's a clear example. There's an article dedicated to technical protection measures. It's Article 11. So then we have to work on that and maybe take the opportunity to yeah, to, to, to reinforce the message that these TPMs should not um, not only be abused, but uh, yeah, the, the protection of these TPMs themselves should be foreseen with the highest level of, of scrutiny from a legal angle. Thank you very much, even though uh, we don't like to hear these hard answers. We would like to we would like to fix it with one overarching piece of legislation and and just get it over with. But um, that's it's important to face the re the legal reality as well. Um, we have another uh, a more um, straightforward question, which is: Can spare parts also be subject to design protection? 
I see Stefan nodding, so maybe he wants to take the floor. Um, so, um, yeah, it is. It already is because, uh, for example, the the screen of the iPhone. Um, we had in the past we had already had problems um, with the import because they come from China and they are part of the design. And um, it was because of the, the small uh, hole for the home button, um, because this design uh, is, is protected, um, which was interesting because it was not protected by German law because German law uh, excluded spare parts of this uh, uh, kind of protection, but the European law uh, made it impossible or, or problematic. Um, so this was the first problem. Another problem is uh, when we, for example, import spare parts from China, they, um, <clears throat> because they are out of the same factory, the spare parts. Uh, so they have the, the, the logo of the back cover for the, for the iPhones. Uh, there's a logo uh, of, of Apple. And so we can't, uh, yeah, we can't, we, we have these problems already with spare parts. Um, which is special with the smartphones because I think 90% or 80% of repairing spare parts is, is the, 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 the display or the, um, or yeah, or the back cover. So, um, we normally, we can't fix these parts because Apple is not selling uh, the spare parts. Uh, we also have this problem with some other, um, yeah, other parts of machines, but the the biggest problem is within this uh, um, the smartphone market. But we have a different problem um, with the with the um, yeah the contracts or the um, the law with the spare parts because the um, deliverers they are um, they have uh, contracts with the manufacturers, and it's for them it's forbidden to to deliver spare parts to us. And I think this is also a big problem um, because uh, we can't get spare parts if the deliverer or the manufacturer or both um, are not, uh, yeah, they don't sell spare parts to us or they are not allowed to sell spare parts. Thank you very much for this um, comprehensive uh, answer that was also uh, shedding some light on the smartphone situation that was supposed to be covered but we had some um technical issues there so thank you very much for thank you very much for this um the next question that that we have seen is uh, actually a question uh, i can give an answer to the uh, question is can a label be added to goods sold in the u as a scale of preferability on products sold it would need uh, it will need to include different criteria such as the actual possibility to repair um, devices, the cost of, uh, of repair um, uh, and, and different things. Um, this is actually something that the Right to Repair campaign is um, working on. This is something that the Right to Repair campaign is advocating for, has been pushing for for a long time. Uh, we are now uh, even more concretely than usual working on it because uh, an EU scale of reparability, so a new uh, repair score has been proposed within the um, eco-design uh, plan of the EU Commission for smartphones and tablets. So for smartphones and tablets, we are talking at EU level uh, of a reparability score. Um, so if you're interested in this topic, please, uh, subscribe to the newsletter of the Right to Repair campaign, head to uh, repair.eu for more information, blog posts, also possibilities to get involved and support this fight, uh, definitely, because we are very actively uh, working on this. And um, at EU level, it looks like it's going to happen. Uh, product category by product category. So for the moment, that's for smartphones and tablets we're talking about. Um, another question, which is more general, would be, uh, can free and open source software be the answer? Uh, this is maybe uh, a question for Anthony. 
So, and, uh, and maybe Stefan has some thoughts on this as well, but I, I think it's, it's a partial answer. Um, you know, a lot of devices, firmware, software is built on Linux um, because it's, you know, I mean, Stefan will tell you why, <laughs> but it's, uh, this means that it's built on a GPL, a general public license, um, and the manufacturer must provide access and allow um, examination, manipulation, interoperability of, of, the, of the program itself. And so there are cases, and particularly in the US, um, the Free Software Foundation is one organization doing this that is researching, taking specific devices and finding if the software that it runs is built on Linux and GPL licenses. And if so, asking the manufacturer to to provide the uh, object and source code. And if they refuse is suing them. And so Vizio is a manufacturer of television screens. And there's a, there's a case um, recently in the United States about um, the Free Software Foundation um, um, wielding a lawsuit against Vizio for its um, refusal to provide access to that. So this is one example and it, it takes a lot of energy and research and money to fund litigation, but this is one approach to kind of um, use open source software as as a way of um, as a way of forcing manufacturers to allow repairability. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, answer, Stefan. You wanted to share some thoughts as well. Yeah, I think it's interesting because uh, we already, like Anthony told us, we already have this situation. Uh, the the, um, the 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 brand I, I was talking about in, in my presentation. Um, the Thermomix is, um, for example, is open source software, but uh, they still uh, block us for changing the parts and we cannot, um, because we are workshops, we're not like uh, professional programming uh, people and no hackers. And so um, I'm not sure about the legal situation, but in the, in, the, in the fact or in the practice, it doesn't help us to have open source software if the uh, manufacturer is still blocking blocking us and uh, not giving us the tools to, to use the open source. Uh, thank you very much for, for this answer on open source. Uh, we've uh, also had some comments on licenses. Uh, the first one being maybe a little bit of a straightforward one, which says can't notice just mean hiding information in pages of license agreements uh, you are going to click through considering you already probably paid for the product it should be uh, shared uh, before the product is sold uh, i believe this comment uh, is referring to um, licenses uh, but also uh, to uh, TPMs, I believe, and the need for the, the, the fact that we don't, uh, that there is no need for uh, manufacturers to provide notice um, of, of TPMs. Uh, so uh, maybe our legal experts um, could share some thoughts on this. I'm sorry, I, I don't fully understand the question. So, so is it that there's is it questioning whether there's some tool for forcing manufacturers to provide notice of TPMs? Yeah, I believe I believe uh, this participant uh, finds it a bit unfair that uh, not only um, there isn't really any notice which is provided, but also uh, you have no means to know before you actually uh, bought the, the product uh, that there were some um, restricting TPMs or there were some um, functionalities you don't really have access to or you only have access to in, in some very specific ways. Yeah, so I think again, in order to get to the point where we're able to provide consumers that type of notice, we, we would need to first have more technical and legal research on, on the different types of TPMs and what the range of the things that they can restrict so that we could classify them. Um, and you know, if, if we're going to go along the same lines of a repairability score, we need some way of measuring it. And currently with as this broad concept of TPM, um, there's not really an easy way to measure. So that's probably the starting point. Um, you know, I think maybe in the shorter term, what, will, what would be more helpful uh, would be, again, we've talked a lot about competition, or sorry, we talked a lot about uh, consumer protection and IP, um, but we're, we're kind of maybe leaving the, the elephant in the room out of the picture, which is um, 
you know, competition authorities. And, you know, uh, the, the, the practical implication of these TPMs in many cases is to suppress competition like, like Stefan's. Um, and, and so I think if there, is the, if there is maybe a one size fits all solution, aside from amending IP policy and all of the difficulties that that entails with international agreements and stakeholders and lobbying and all of those things, you know, perhaps empowering competition authorities to, um, to take a stronger look at, at TPMs that are used in a particularly anti-competitive way um, would, be, would be the right approach. And um, that may then um, filter down into the type of notice that um, consumers would have um, it, when, they, when they're purchasing products and devices. Thank you for, for this clarification. Uh, also on the same topic of licenses, um, there was one comment about implied licenses. Um, the question is basically implied licenses is expressed terms in a contract can take away the implied rights or at least some say in the United States are implied licenses robust in EU law or other relevant jurisdictions or subject to contractual overrides? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not, I don't fully understand the question. Um, um, so the question is about implied licenses and whether they are robust in EU law or other relevant jurisdictions. Right. Um, so an implied license, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I'm not sure what it's meant by robust. Uh, it's certainly a, a possibility to, to rely on implied licensing as a way to provide owners of, of products and devices um, some, some rights to use or access the underlying software. Um, that, that's certainly a possibility within the EU, just as it is um, in the United States. Um, I'm not sure exactly what's meant by robust, but um, the opportunity is certainly there. Thanks, thanks very much. Uh, maybe one last, one last question, which is specifically about um, a, a case regarding, uh, regarding a type of printer. Um, the comment is mentioning someone who was mentioning a Lexmark case in the United States. Um, uh, the person was saying, thanks for mentioning Lexmark. Can you say more about the reasoning of that US case in the U? Well, so yeah, that, that, would, that would almost be its own academic article. Um, <laughs> there's a, uh, yeah, so, so that, that case had to deal with the United States um, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which treats TPMs a little bit differently than in the EU for, for the single reason that, that in the US, there's not this distinction between copyright TPMs and or sorry, between computer programs, TPMs, and other types. There's just one under the US DMCA. Um, and also the United States Digital Millennium Copyright Act um, treats TPMs as, as access control, explicitly access control, rather than um, the, the references in EU uh, directives, which seem to imply more of a relationship to copyright. So it, in, in the US, it's more explicitly that TPMs can be used for something completely unrelated to copyright. Whereas in the EU, there's there seems to be more in the language of both directives a suggestion that TPMs must bear some relationship to copyrights exclusive rights. So the case is distinguishable from the EU a little bit in that respect. Um, but you know, functionally, the case had to do with um, with a, ch a chip embedded in the printer ink cartridge um, that would interoperate with the printer itself before it would allow. Um, the, uh, the, the device to print. And the question was, you know, whether this constituted a TPM uh, and whether circumvention of it was in violation of the DMCA. Um, so I think it's useful. It's useful for EU policy in, in terms of showing us what manufacturers are capable of doing on a functional level. But in terms of uh, uh, hard law policymaking, there, there is some, some room to distinguish uh, US TPM policy from that in the EU. Thanks very much, Anthony, for trying and uh, squeeze a legal article into a three minutes answer. I really appreciate your efforts and also thanks for, for 
thanks to all the speakers. We are going to uh, close it here. We already took 10 more minutes because there were so many comments and questions. So I really would like to thank all the speakers that took the time to join us and to stay a little bit longer. Um, also, just in conclusion, I would like to, I would like maybe to stress, uh, I think it's clear to everyone that we need more political uh, push if we want to see this through, if we want to have a majority in the European Parliament, for instance, uh, to really push uh, also the, let's say, copyright dimension of this in a direction that is more favorable for right to repair. Uh, so if you like what you heard, or maybe you didn't like at all what you heard more in this sense, if you um, like the direction that we are trying to push things, so that would be more, um, more right to say. Uh, please consider sus subscribing to our newsletter. Uh, visit uh, righttorepair.eu for more information about our activities. There you will find ways to uh, support our faith, uh, donate if you can, and, and get involved. Um, let me also take the chance to um, um, let you know about some upcoming events that we have in Brussels uh, on the weekend of the 1st and 2nd of October, FixFest, which is an international gathering for community repair, is coming to Brussels. You will see some information at repair.eu as well. And um, you, uh, we are also organizing an EU policy event on the 30th of September, you will see more information there as well. And you can participate both in person and online. So you have uh, the opportunity to subscribe and register. Thank you very much to everyone for joining and for participating in the debate. Thank you very much and have a good day.